everyone. Welcome to the first live lecture segment of Meet Our Professor series. Last week, we sat down with Professor Caroline McIntosh. Professor McIntosh graduated at the Wessex School of Podiatry, did her master's at Queen Margaret University, and her PhD at Huddersfield. In her first job as a senior two podiatrist, Professor McIntosh discovered her passion for wound management. This passion propelled her to further her education, aiming towards research as a result. Uh, professor McIntosh became the youngest female professor at the age of 35. This is ab absolutely a true testament to how resilient and determined she is. Reflecting back on one of the biggest hurdles she's had to overcome, she says, and I quote, establishing a new school of podiatry in the midst of an economic crisis. Today we are treated with a live lecture that Professor McIntosh has prepared for us. So please help me in welcoming one tough cookie, Professor McIntosh. Thanks very much, Ekta, for the um, fantastic introduction there. And thanks very much for the kind invitation to, uh, to talk to everybody uh, this evening. Um, it's a particular pleasure for me to be um, delivering the first um, or the inaugural uh, professor lecture um, as part of the Tomorrow's Podiatry Initiative. So um, once again, thanks for the invite. So. As Hector said, throughout my career, really, I have had a, um, a passion for diabetic foot disease and the management of diabetic foot disease. Um, throughout my career, mostly my research has focused on um, interventional research, looking at um, wound healing, particularly and, and tissue repair. But over the last number of years, I've started to focus more on um, preventative research um, and starting to think where we should be going really in terms of preventing diabetic foot problems. Um, and as part of my, my lecture this evening, um, what I want to talk to you about is a focus on prevention and a particular focus on psychosocial issues and maybe where we as podiatrists could be doing a little bit more in terms of addressing either psychological issues or social issues that impact our patients who are living with diabetic foot disease and diabetic foot ulceration. So just to set the scene and have a think about some of the epidemiological data in terms of diabetes and in terms of the diabetic foot, we know that the prevalence of diabetes is increasing across the UK, across Ireland, across uh, the globe, essentially. Um, and some of the, the figures are quite staggering. So it's estimated at the moment that um, one in 11 adults will be di or have diabetes. Um, but more concerningly, about one in two would actually have undiagnosed diabetes. So these figures might be an underestimation. But it's predicted that that's likely to change to one in 10 adults over the coming years. And currently 415 million people across the globe have diabetes. And again, that's rising um, quite drastically. In 2019, according to the World Health Organization, diabetes was the ninth leading cause of death worldwide. And again, these figures are quite staggering in terms of um, the number of deaths directly because of diabetes. It's five million per annum across the globe, or when you put it into statistics, one in every seven seconds. Then in terms of diabetic foot disease, so of all of the complications associated with diabetes mellitus, we'll generally think of them as macrovascular problems, and microvascular problems, um, macrovascular being the cardiovascular disease problems and micro being retinopathy, um, nephropathy and peripheral neuropathy. And the diabetic foot often um, is one of, the, one of the most serious complications associated with diabetes. And we can define the diabetic foot or diabetic foot disease as the presence of several characteristic diabetic foot complications, which would include the various neuropathies, so sensory, motor, autonomic, uh, peripheral ischemia, infection, ulceration, and or Charcot's foot or Charcot neuroarthropathy. And diabetic foot ulcers and impaired healing are just one of several complications associated with diabetic foot disease. The global prevalence of diabetic foot ulceration is about 6.3, which is actually the exact prevalence that's reported currently for the United Kingdom. And the lifetime risk of your patients developing a foot ulcer is about 15 to 25%. So if you think of all of your patients that you see with diabetes, about a quarter of those individuals might present with a diabetic foot ulcer at some stage of the disease duration. And actually out of all of the complications associated with diabetes, diabetic foot ulceration actually accounts for more hospitalizations. So approximately 25% of all hospital admissions. And generally it's because of sepsis or a limb or a life-threatening infection. 
So we really need to be thinking of a diabetic foot ulceration as a serious marker of disease or almost advanced disease in diabetes um, because they do significantly impact on mobility and significantly impact on mortality. So in terms of mobility, um, Rogers et al. produced the stairway to amputation back in 2010, and it's a really use useful visual just to think about the steps towards a lower extremity amputation in the presence of diabetes. So generally, the effects of chronic hyperglycemia will have an effect on the micro and the macrovascular systems. So very often, one of the first changes is neuropathy, and that might lead to an insensate foot, which is predisposed to trauma or an unrecognized trauma, which can go on to lead to an area of ulceration. Then peripheral arterial disease is a complicating factor in about 65% of diabetic foot ulcers. So though with vascular impairment, that will um, reduce the body's capability of wound healing. And then because of the effects of hyperglycemia, Individuals can also um, be immunocompromised and therefore opportunistic infection is very common in the diabetic foot. So when we couple all of these factors together, then an individual is much more predisposed to amputation. And we know that 85% of lower extremity amputations are preceded by a diabetic foot ulcer. And again, one of those staggering statistics um, that was produced back in, uh, I think it was 2011, they first said a limb is lost to diabetes, sorry, it was 2005, a limb is lost to diabetes every 30 seconds across the globe. And that was actually revised to a limb is lost to diabetes every 30 seconds across the globe in 2011. Uh, sorry, 20 seconds across the globe in 2011. So we're actually, our, our figures are actually getting worse and not better. And then in terms of mortality rates, so emerging evidence has highlighted the increased mortality rates associated with diabetic foot disease. And speaking with um, one of our endocrinologists uh, recently, he was saying, uh, you know, increasingly he's actually writing down on a death certificate, cause of death, diabetic foot ulcer. Um, and recent research has shown that the risk of death is ninefold the risk of amputation. So as podiatrists, we spend a lot of our time actually thinking about how we might go on to prevent an amputation in these individuals. But in actual fact, the risk of, of early or premature death uh, is much more common in these individuals. And then the five-year survival rate following a new episode of ulceration is about 50 to 60%. So it's again thinking of a diabetic foot ulcer as really an a symptom of advanced diabetes. Um, and the outcome is often worse than many common cancers. So now that I've set the scene in terms of the devastating outcomes of diabetes mellitus, then surely it shouldn't need to be a eureka kind of light bulb moment that prevention is better than cure. But actually, when we look at what research is in existence, diabetic foot ulcers or the prevention of diabetic foot ulcers receive very little attention. And this was highlighted by Buss and Van Netten in a paper back in 2015. And of 100 RCTs published, so randomized controlled trials published in 2015 on the diabetic foot, 62 were on ulcer healing and six were on prevention. So of every clinical trial conducted on prevention, 10 are conducted on healing. So there's very little focus and that hasn't changed much over the last five to six years. Um, and generally we can say that the evidence base for primary prevention is practically non-existent. So just looking at some of the figures, if we have primary prevention is the prevention of a first ulceration in an individual and secondary prevention is the prevention of a recurrence of an ulceration in an individual. So the incidence of ulcer recurrence is 40% in the first 12 months. So if we get our patients to heal and the diabetic foot ulcer has, has healed, we generally consider that individual in remission and structured follow-up care is absolutely vital to stop or try to minimize the risk of a further recurrence. But nonetheless, 40% will um, have a further episode of ulceration within 12 months. Whereas in terms of primary prevention, just 7.5% incidence of first ulcer in those with neuropathy and no previous diabetic foot ulcer. And if somebody has had a, a previous ulcer, recurrence actually increases as time goes on as well. So recurrence is about 60% at three years and 65% at five years. 
So again, highlighted by Binning et al, um, they've highlighted that if the first ulcer is prevented or postponed, then diabetic foot ulcer incidence rates will drop substantially. So I would certainly say as a profession, what we really need to be doing is investing our energy, our clinical time and our research into the prevention of foot ulceration to try to stop all of those devastating outcomes happening and changing a person's trajectory in terms of the management of their, their diabetes and minimizing the impact of diabetic foot disease. But unfortunately, what we often do um, in terms of clinical services and in terms of research is we focus more on when the problem has already presented, how best do we um, make this, this problem or this ulceration heal? So in terms of some primary prevention strategies, we know that these are the, the typical prevention strategies that would be recommended for somebody when they present with diabetes. So generally, first line treatments would be dietary and lifestyle modifications. So we know that individuals who um, lose weight can better control their diabetes and those who maintain a healthy weight can better control their diabetes. Um, increased physical activity is very important for managing glucose levels, healthy balanced diet, smoke and cessation, good tight glycemic control and management of all of those arterial risk factors is really important. And then patient education um, in order to, to inform patients of um, these prevention strategies, all very important. But then if it's so simple, why does it not work in a lot of cases? So I like this particular diagram here. I can control my diabetes by eating veggies, exercising regularly and drinking water. We all know that we can change our lifestyle for the better if we were to take on board a lot of this advice. However, not everybody does. And I, you know, typically I'm holding out for, for better options. Um, and Binningagdell had said, knowing does not necessarily translate into doing. So even when we know what we should be doing to manage our own health, we don't necessarily do it. As part of our research group at NUI Galway, I've been working with uh, Lauren Connell, um, who was undertaking her master's degree at the time, looking at well-being. So we particularly used a patient and public um, form of research where we would invite members of the public to talk to us. So it's not, not necessarily um, in a research context where we are researching those individuals, but we're chatting to them about what we should do as researchers in terms of looking at well-being in patients living with diabetes. And in terms of patient education, this was some of the patient perspectives. So generally, they were saying that at the time of diagnosis of diabetes or at the time of a diagnosis of a diabetic foot ulcer, they had a lack of knowledge around either the diabetes itself or of the foot complications that were likely to um, occur in diabetes. And they also said that there's a lack of understanding of what podiatry is. So they'd never even heard of podiatry until a lower limb problem had arisen and then they were referred on to the podiatrist. So it's a quote there, I didn't even know the of the word podiatry at the time. So very much what our patients were telling us is important in terms of moving forward with our own research agenda is that they expressed a desire for early and positive education strategies. So in terms of patient education, when we think of what we do as clinicians, um, really what we do is focus on fairly traditional approaches to improve knowledge and to um, or basically try to impart our knowledge on our patients to hopefully improve their knowledge and hopefully encourage them to undertake self-care in the way that we'd like them to. And whilst absolutely patient education does remain a cornerstone of practice, it has been shown to have minimal effect on ulcer healing rates or prevention of ulceration. A Cochrane review also looked at the impact of patient education and said it may be beneficial in the short term, but there isn't much evidence to show that longer term it works and there isn't really any strong evidence to show that it will prevent ulcerations from happening. And again, I like this particular um, image at the top there, which says, you know, metformin, take one at night and stop eating McDonald's, otherwise your foot will fall off. Not the type of education we generally give to our patients. But then looking at what's written in NICE guidelines, this is around patient education. So what we are supposed to do as podiatrists is for people who are at low risk of developing a diabetic foot problem, advise them that they could progress to moderate or high risk. Um, 
And to the, what does that mean to a patient, essentially? I mean, if I'm told I'm low risk of getting a condition, then great. I wouldn't go about probably changing any of my behaviours. But what does actually it mean to them? Do they understand what we mean by you might progress to moderate or you might progress to high risk? Um, it's certainly not as plain as the image above on the metformin package. So when we chatted to our patients about their perspectives on um, communication and well-being and what they expected um, in terms of research, what they picked up on was the need for health literacy and knowledge translation. So they said that they had difficulty in understanding and interpreting information from health professionals. That treatment plans without the patient's opinion um, being taken into account was, was quite common and that increased clinician engagement meant that there was a feeling of support and, and empathy. Um, so I think as, as podiatrists what we could do is take away from this is thinking about the importance of the way that we communicate with patients thinking about health literacy and thinking about that knowledge translation how do we impart education and how do we do it in a language um, that's understandable and accessible for our patients with diabetic foot disease so again just some quotes from what our patients had said so I said would you slow down have you got any English? I said, because I haven't a clue about what you're talking about. Um, and another quote, they should have more understanding towards patients. They should be able to explain more to you. So really our group was expressing the need for uh, better communication um, and on a level that's understandable and maybe you know, little jargon, for instance, um, for the patient. What we do know from the evidence in terms of prevention is that foot screening, um, is important to prevent problems from happening, but also to identify those at risk of diabetic foot ulcer. And NICE guidelines generally recommend that adults with diabetes should be assessed for the risk of developing a diabetic foot problem when diabetes is diagnosed and at least annually thereafter. And again, what our group were really saying is that it's that point of diagnosis where there really needs to be a good level of education. Maybe that's where they should be meeting with the podiatrist and having some kind of structured um, education for, for foot health um, to hopefully stop problems. You know, we've got an early window op of opportunity to try to stop problems from happening because really the next stages where they're saying that they should be assessed for risk is when foot problems arise, which is really a little bit too late, and then on admission to, to hospital, which is obviously very late in the day. And then NICE further state in terms of prevention, and really when you look at the NICE guidelines and indeed other international guidelines on the diabetic foot, most of the guidelines focus on intervention and treatments and there isn't much on prevention and again there is that lack of evidence really to, to look at um, preventative measures. So in addition to risk assessment, NICE say that you know, as podiatrists we should be leading the way in this, we should be assessing the biomechanical status of the foot, assess the need for um, footwear and orthoses, Oops, sorry, I've got something popping up on my screen there. Assess the vascular status of the lower limbs. Establish a foot protection service in the community led by a podiatrist with specialist training in diabetic foot problems. And then that foot protection service should be liaising with other healthcare professionals because, of course, we know that the multidisciplinary team is really crucial in managing diabetes. So now as now, Akowska and colleagues um, had a, a published a paper in 2019 that really looked at the prevalence of comorbidities that exist with diabetes. Um, and what I have on the, the top there are concordant conditions. So these are conditions that we associate with, with type 2 diabetes and therefore patients with type 2 diabetes tend to be managed very well in terms of these either arterial risk factors in terms of hypertension, cardiovascular disease we know is associated with diabetes and chronic kidney disease. So patients generally are well managed and um, those concordant conditions are positively associated with quality care. The discordant conditions at the bottom um, are the most common comorbidities that people with type 2 diabetes mellitus live with, but they don't necessarily get managed as part of the, the whole process of managing type 2 diabetes. So depression you'll see there, um, I've just highlighted in red, um, is very common actually in patients living with chronic disease um, and in patients with type 2 diabetes mellitus. 
Then thyroid gland disease and um, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease were other um, common comorbidities. So the discordant conditions like depression, I think they often get overlooked. Um, yet, if somebody has depression or is living with depression, it could pose barriers to lifestyle changes. It could um, lead to negative health behaviours and, and challenges in trying to, for us to try to promote positive health behaviours. Um, and really, it should be part of an overall holistic approach that somebody is assessed for depression in diabetes mellitus um, and that could be managed accordingly. Kirsty Winkley's done quite a lot of work looking at diabetes and depression. Um, and what she's found is that diabetes and depression occur together twice as frequently as would be predicted by chance. And in diabetes, depression is associated with a twofold increase in mortality in people with their first DFU at five years. So then that's quite staggering. You're more likely to develop a diabetic foot ulcer if you have depression, but you're also more likely to die early if you develop a diabetic foot ulcer and you have depression. And we know that depression may be a precursor to self-neglect, disturbed sleep, poor nutrition, and negative health behaviours, which is more than likely um, contributing to those poor, poor outcomes in people who are depressed. And depression is frequently missed in people with diabetes. I think as podiatrists, we maybe log it in medical records. Um, how much do we explore it? Do we refer people on? Um, certainly my experience of working in multidisciplinary teams, we really did not have any support from psychologists um, to assist with this. They're really not part of the, the wider MDT. You're very lucky if you work in an area that does have access to psychologists, uh, but generally they're, they're definitely a missing link in the, the multidisciplinary team. So depression can often be missed, um, but there are useful screening tools available. And one example of a screening tool is the Hospital Anxiety and Depression Scale, which is a fairly straightforward um, a tool which basically I think it's only one to two pages um, it has questions down one side related to depression questions down the other side related to anxiety and it's a case of adding up the score to identify whether somebody might be living with anxiety or depression and that's definitely something as podiatrists as part of our history take as part of our assessment we could be looking at so that when we do identify somebody with depression it might be that we can refer them on um, through their GP or other means um, to get a appropriate treatment. And just thinking about the human psyche, I think in, in terms of diabetic foot disease, what we tend to concentrate on a lot of the time is the physical aspect of diabetic foot disease. So we'll manage wounds, we'll look at neuropathy, we'll, we'll do blood tests. It's, it's all very physical in terms of how we would manage somebody with a diabetic foot. But little focus is really given on the human psyche. And I like this quote by Hopkins back in 2001, where he said, people's minds can be harder to treat than their bodies. The human psyche has the capacity to rationalize, ignore or deny the unpleasant if it conflicts with self-perception. So a patient may not be willing to admit the degree to which they are affected. And I think when somebody's living with the diabetic foot, they're living with neuropathy, it's very easy when you don't have the gift of pain. So you can put a sock, you can put a shoe on, you can hide the problem away um, to maybe not seek treatment or, or see the urgency of, of seeking treatment because pain can often be a real driver for somebody to get the help that they need. Yet in the absence of pain, problems can often go unnoticed. And then health behaviours are really important as well. So we can give patient education about how they should be looking after their foot health or we can encourage offloading, et cetera, um, in terms of trying to promote wound healing. But often when you think about health behaviours, what drives people to behave in the way they do? I think it's a, an interesting question. So here I have two patients with Charcot neuroarthropathy who came through the, the clinic um, here in Galway. So the image on the left was a gentleman who, as you can see, he has anhydrotic skin, um, the, the structural deformities associated with the, the shark of foot. Um, and he has had episodes of ulceration you might see on the plantar aspect of the foot, midfoot area. There's a few um, sites where there had been a previous ulcer. But this gentleman was highly engaged in his treatment. He was using emollients on a daily basis. Um, he would wear his footwear, uh, the prescribed footwear and orthoses. Um, at the minute of any concern, he would check his feet daily. And if he was concerned about anything, he would come into us. Um, and so when, when a break 
break in the skin happened, we were able to facilitate healing with his involvement um, much earlier in the day. Whereas the images on the right there, this was another lady who came into the Galway Clinic. Um, and you can see again, she has a shark of foot. Um, and a lot of that area of ulceration looks quite small on the plantar aspect of the foot. When you actually probe into the, the area, the wound was very undermined. So the black's, pro, the black's file would, you know, you could move it right around the, the wound surface. There's a lot more tissue loss under the, um, the, the skin than you can see there. Um, and we kept going through this recurrent cycle of um, infection. So you can see an image on the right was a day where she presented with a cellulitis and we've just marked off the skin there to, to track the, the cellulitic changes. Um, and you can see the, the marked amount of erythema as well around the, the wound and the swelling. So this lady kept coming to us um, over a period of time. She often had very challenging behavior when she came into the, the clinic. Um, she smoked very, very heavily. She was on about 40 cigarettes a day. Um, she was actually a bariatric patient. So whilst orthopedic surgery would, was suggested in terms of improving the structure of the foot to try to promote healing and prevent recurrence, she wasn't a suitable candidate at all because of her lifestyle factors um, for you know, such high risk surgery. So we ended up just going around this cycle um, of infection and then managing that infection. Um, and quite clearly, a lot of the underlying issues, she, she was quite depressed and anxious. She had a lot of stress going on in, in her home life at that point in time. And that would often manifest in anger when she came into the, the clinical facility. So I think often we have to look wider than just the physical, because in this case, you know, we can try to, to manage the physical parameters of the wound. We can try to facilitate wound healing, but ultimately, unless health behaviors change or we can engage the patient fully in a treatment plan um, that works for them as well as us, then we're really not going to get anywhere um, other than keep going around in circles with this vicious cycle of infection. So in terms of psychological factors that affect the diabetic foot, in terms of the, the research literature, um, the, what, what, you know, we know that people with diabetic foot disease are more predisposed to anxiety and depression. There's often a fear, um, and often that fear can be around losing a limb or losing a toe, or um, people might know somebody else who'd lost a limb, or family members might have gone down that route before. So there can be uh, that living in fear all of the time. An anger or frustration, as we were just saying there, in terms of that lady would often vent her anger on us as, as clinicians. But equally, if something's not healing and a patient has unrealistic expectations, that could come back on, on the clinician as well. An altered body image, um, or things like undermining femininity, um, if people have to change their, their footwear, a low self-esteem, loss of confidence, loss of role, um, embarrassment or a stigma attached to the, the wound, loneliness and social isolation often comes through quite strongly in the research literature, dependence on others or feelings of being a burden, um, and a loss of hope are all things that can come through that our patients could be feeling, but often we might not be exploring that with our, our patients patients directly. So this was just an image of a, a gentleman who you can see has had a transmetatarsal amputation and he'd come into the, the clinic and his wound had actually completely healed over. Um, he'd be doing really well. He was pretty compliant with wearing his orthoses. You can see he's got runners down there in the, the background um, and everything was healed really nicely. But he wanted to attend his daughter's wedding um, and he wanted to give his daughter away and walk her down the aisle. So he had a pair of dress shoes and he said to us, can I, can I wear them just, you know, what, what do you think? So we'd said, well, OK, maybe wear them for the ceremony and then try and change into something different afterwards. So you're not wearing them for the, the full day, um, given you know, the, the recent transmetatarsal and, and the history of neuropathy. So, of course, as you can imagine, he enjoyed the day so much um, with his daughter, um, danced the night away on the dance floor and came back to us with this pretty much the, the next day. Um, so we have this new area of ulceration to look at. But body image can be really quite important for the, in that gentleman's case, he didn't want to look different to the others on his daughter's wedding day. But equally, you could have, um, you know, a female who would always wear um, you know, skirts and, and court shoes, for instance, that being told she has to change to um, a big wound boot or a sandal, um, you know, that, that can have a significant impact on how somebody might engage. 
or the feeling of becoming a burden um, can often lead, particularly for our elderly individuals, to maybe not disclose the extent of the problems that they're suffering from. So this was a lady who actually lived on her own um, out in, in Ackle Island in, in Ireland. Um, and her nephew drove quite a distance from um, the south of the country up to, to Ackle on the west to actually bring her into Merlin Park um, because he'd only just come to light that she was suffering from this particular problem. So here we have you know, quite a significant area of, of ulceration. Um, when we probe into here, it probes straight down to um, bone. There was quite some areas of necrotic bone, shards of bone present within the wound. And what you can't see on this image, but it's all between the digits, those interdigital areas, there was tissue breakdown um, and small shards of bone between them. So you know, definitely a, a significant osteomyelitis infection and we had to get her admitted straight into to hospital. Um, so people present very late in the day because they're worried that they'll be, become a burden to, to other people or they, they, you know, they, they don't want to exclude the extent of any particular problem. This was a paper we had published back in 2019 when we particularly had a look at optimizing well-being in patients with diabetic foot ulcerations. And I mentioned Lauren Connell's name earlier on. So she subsequently went on to um, have a look at, at patient well-being in patients with uh, diabetic foot ulcerations as part of her master's degree. So just thinking about well-being, so while the physical aspects of diabetic foot syndrome or disease can be measured, the concept of well-being is often more challenging to capture. So the image on the right there is really looking at kind of a biopsychosocial approach where we need to think about the spirit, the mind and the body. So it can be defined as a dynamic matrix of factors, including physical parameters, psychological parameters and spiritual or cultural parameters. And the concept of well-being is, is very much individual and it will vary over time depending on um, things like the status of the, the wound, for instance. So thinking about some of the domains of well-being, we have physical well-being and that's generally categorised as the ability for somebody to function independently. Um, so to be able to do things like um, bathing, dressing, eating, moving around, for instance. So that can be significantly impaired when we start to think about putting somebody into, say, an offloading device, a total contact cast um, that might hinder somebody's independence. And certainly I've, I've known patients who maybe lived on their own. Um, there was a lady I'm thinking who had a shark or foot, for instance, we had to arrange for um, social work to go in and meals on wheels and um, so that we could completely offload her, her foot um, because of the acute shark or problem at the time. And then mental well-being. So this implies that cognitive faculties are intact and that the patient is free from fear, anxiety, stress, depression or other negative emotions. So just thinking about the psychological impact of diabetic foot ulcers that I was talking about earlier, you can quite easily see how mental well-being is significantly impacted upon when somebody is living with a chronic disease and a chronic wound. Social well-being then is the ability to participate in and engage with family, society, friends and workers. And this is an area that certainly from our research is brought to the fore by patients. So they often feel that their social well-being is significantly impacted upon um, when they're living with a wound, a, a chronic um, lower extremity wound, a diabetic foot ulcer. And that might be their ability to engage in work. It might be their interaction with their family, um, generally going into kind of a social isolation uh, because of the either the embarrassment or there's an odour attached to the wound or they're just not able to get out and about. Um, and it's kind of a, a social isolation that's important imposed upon them. And then spiritual well-being, so an ability to experience and integrate meaning and purpose in life through connection with oneself and with others. Um, and cultural issues can come into to that domain as well in terms of what one's beliefs might be in terms of um, what well-being is. So in terms of social isolation, these again were some of the comments that came through from our patient discussions. So um, they really raised issues around physical barriers that can have an impact on their social life. Um, that one of the ideas was that it would be really helpful to meet with other people who were experiencing the same problem. 
And I know Ellie Lindsay set up the Lindsay Leg Clubs in the UK for people with leg ulcers. And that really was to address this kind of social barriers and social issues that people living with um, leg ulceration for, for you know, long periods of time could come together. And this was something our patients actually expressed that they would like to happen, that they'd like to see a similar group or interest so that they could support each other um, and feel that they weren't alone in, in terms of living with a foot ulceration. And then there was comments that living alone is particularly isolating. And then, of course, these feelings were completely exacerbated because of the social isolation during the COVID-19 pandemic. So, again, just a quote, you know, I miss all that. I love going to the shops and I miss all that. But that's all gone. You know, so they felt that they couldn't get out and do the normal things and socially interact you know, in society. And then I think this is a particularly powerful quote. Some days you just want to talk to someone. Um, which really does highlight the isolation that people can live with. Then I think as practitioners, we really need to kind of move away from the word compliance because compliance is basically um, expecting somebody to conform with what we want them to do. And you often hear of patients being labelled, oh, then they're not compliant, they're not doing what they're, they're supposed to do. Um, I, I remember giving a, a similar talk to this in the, the US and I was talking about psychosocial approaches to lower extremity wounds. And one of my colleagues was in the audience and um, when I was talking about, um, you know, thinking about patient involvement in their care and, and psychological issues and um, the comment that came back was, was literally, well, why bother? They don't do what you say anyway. <laughs> um, so I think we really need to shift away from that kind of attitude and really work with collaboration, openness between um, ourselves and the patient so that we can basically get a greater insight into the difficulties that that patient is experiencing and try to bring them on board with our treatment planning. This image here was a gentleman who again came through the, the clinic in Galway um, and you can see a typical neuropathic ulceration. He was a farmer, um, so he was out in the fields with his wellies on quite a lot of the time. Um, ideally, you know, his blood supply was fine. Ideally, we want to get him into an offloading device and at the time we arranged for an appointment for him to go into a total contact cast. We explained that this would help to heal the wound up quicker, but he needed to go into a cast to try to, to facilitate that. Um, a, a colleague of mine took him over to the plaster room, ready to, to have his cast fitted. Um, and I can remember to this day driving up to the hospital because I was on clinic that afternoon. And he has this gentleman running down the driveway of the hospital. When I got up to the, the, the clinic and said, was that Mr. Such and Such? I saw running down the, uh, the, the the lane um, and it turned out he'd the first opportunity he'd left the plaster room and done a runner because he didn't want to have a cast so again it, it's it's really talking about that openness between a patient and a practitioner um, and and listening to them and, and their reservations in terms of treatment planning and trying to get them on board so that if we can't offer what we think is best practice we can offer something that will meet you know in the middle and hopefully um, get some good outcomes in terms of control, generally it's recognised that if we feel in control over a situation, then we're less likely to feel stressed and we're less likely to feel pain. Um, whereas if patients have control or influence on their condition, they, they, they will have better engagement in self-care. So it's really important when you're working with your patients that you do engage with them and try to ensure that they have that feel that they are still in control and that was something that came up in our research as well that, that feeling of not being in control anymore and that the practitioners are the bosses and we just do as they say uh, when it shouldn't be that that type of interaction or that that um, you know it should be a two-way situation uh, where the patient still very much feels at the center of their care. So healthcare practitioners really should try to empower patients to take the control of their condition and treatment. So in terms of empowerment, just thinking about um, of the how they control their diabetes, how they go about controlling their foot health um, to a management that level that's acceptable to them. There is a lot of evidence that does show where patients are actively involved in the care, then outcomes will improve and we will get better results um, by involving patients in their own care planning and in their own treatments. So encourage empowerment through shared decision making and through self-management and things like patient diaries can actually be useful. So you could um, use a diary, for instance, to record um, pain, activities of daily living or record um, different aspects of well-being, for instance. One topic that came up with our um, patient panel uh, was around self-efficacy. 
So this is essentially where um, there's a recognition that self-awareness and motivation are essential to a positive outlook in diabetic foot ulcers. Some of the panel members said that coping mechanisms are important to lead a normal lifestyle. Um, but some said that lack of self-confidence, identity and respect were factors and feelings of lack of control, as I was just talking about, particularly at a stage of diagnosis. And this is a, a, a quite a powerful quote again. It upsets you. It does. Now we just have to get on with it. That's all there is to it. You know, you just have to put up with it. And they're the bosses. So they're referring to the podiatrists in the clinic and, and that feeling of perhaps of being out of control and that we just have to do what we're told, essentially. I think this is a really excellent example of empowering patients and encouraging self-management. And this is um, from NHS Scotland. So it's called My Diabetes, My Way. So it's a website that's set up, um, sort of an interactive website that helps people with diabetes and their family and their friends to um, access videos, educational tools, up-to-date information about diabetes. But crucially, it also allows them to log in to get their own diabetes clinic results so that they can help themselves to manage their own condition more effectively. Then in terms of stress, so the impact that stress can have on health and well-being. Um, so again, stress could be something that we do overlook when we're doing our, our history taking or, or patient assessments. But physiologically, if somebody has chronic stress, then they have increased cortisol levels, which can impact on both glycemic control, blood pressure and depression. And then psychologically, the response to stress is associated with unhealthy behaviours. So if somebody's living in a stressed state, then it can increase the likelihood of people choosing negative health behaviours or making negative appraisals of situations or events. So what can we do? What can we do as practitioners? Um, we, we've talked about the, the, you know, the different psychosocial aspects that might impact on our patients with diabetic foot ulcerations, but what can we do as podiatrists? So generally, there's a couple of different approaches. The psychotherapeutic approach, which is aimed at emotional, improving emotional, cognitive or behavioral functioning, and then psychosomatic, which is aimed at addressing stress or anxiety. So some of these, these things we might think about making a referral on to individuals who are specifically trained in a, in a technique, but other things we could do ourselves as part of our um, relationship with the patient. So talking therapy and fostering a supportive relationship, that's something we, we can do as a practitioner. We spend more time um, with that patient on the couch, chatting to that individual than many other healthcare professionals do. So certainly we could look at talking therapy, we could look at um, reflective listening and helping to foster that supportive relationship. Promoting patient autonomy and control. And again, it's that empowering the patient to try to manage their own self self um, care. So certainly there are things that we could do. Counseling therapy, we might refer on to the GP for an onward referral. Um, or if you can access a, a counsellor or, or a um, psychologist, then fantastic. Cognitive behavioural therapies, um, something that, that could be recommended. Contract setting, again, could be something that we could get involved with in terms of either um, agreeing a, a goal setting with the patient. Um, maybe it's around offloading, you know, how, how many steps can you use with your, your boot today or um, in terms of um, thermal scanning, for instance. You know, can you use, um, can you take temperature measurements on a daily basis to prevent problems from arising or self-monitoring of behaviours? And another area that's particularly of interest to me at the moment, um, I'm just going through my own training on motivational interviewing, but that could be something that we could bring into our own um, treatment um, with the patient. So in terms of psychological interventions, Basically, what they do is use the therapeutic alliance between the patient and the therapist or the podiatrist to bring about change in emotional, cognitive and behavioural functioning. And I suppose psychological interventions are there to aim to reduce levels of psychological distress, depression and stress. And hopefully through an intervention, we might improve confidence and self-management and support lifestyle changes that would help to promote either wound healing or hopefully prevent problems from happening in the first place. So this was a, a recent publication of ours um, where we looked at the psychological interventions for treating foot ulcers and preventing their reoccurrence in people with diabetes. So this is published in the Cochrane Database of Systematic Reviews. Um, and we looked for you know, the, the evidence from randomized controlled trials around the effectiveness of psychological interventions. 
Um, we were unable to determine whether psychological interventions are of any benefit to people with an active foot ulcer or a history of diabetic foot ulcers um, or to prevent recurrence. And that was really because there are a few trials of psychological interventions in this area. And of the few trials that we did find, um, there was a big, the, you know, the quality, methodological quality was quite low and there was a significant risk of bias. Other tools, I'd mentioned the HADS tool previously, but other tools that you could use as part of your treatment and engagement with the patient um, would be health-related quality of life tools, for instance. And a lot of these are freely available for you to download the form and you could be using it chairside and in the clinical setting. So some um, things like the short form health survey, um, so there's 36 questions there, so that's a bit longer, but the Euroqual is just five specific questions about um, health-related quality of life, and the SF12 is 12 questions there. Then there's ones that are specific to um, wounds, so Cardiff Wound Impact Schedule, the Freiburg Life Quality Assessment. Pain scales, I'm sure a lot of us do use pain scales, the visual analog scale or the McGill pain questionnaire. Um, I've mentioned the HADS and then the NeuroQual, which is a, a quality of life tool specifically for neurological disorders. So I'm just going to show you an example of where we use the NeuroQual. So this was um, a case study that myself and um, Laura Kelly, a podiatrist in the Diabetes Day Centre here in Galway, published back in 2009. So this was a 57-year-old guy with type 2 diabetes. His HbA1c was high at 9.9, .9, high BMI. Um, he was on metformin and glycoside to control his diabetes, and he had no neuropathy, retinopathy, hypertension, hypercholesterolemia. And these were the wounds on presentation, so quite small um, in comparison to other DFUs and quite superficial. So you have an overgranulation there on the right foot on initial presentation, and then we have um, two areas of tissue breakdown on the left foot. This is week two, so you can see just with good debridement and um, offloading, um, we were able to, to move from, you can see it's quite a dull overgranulated base there on the right foot to a nice healthy uh, wound bed on the, the right foot there. And we've got some wound closure and epithelialization and happening on the heel. And this is at week five. So these wounds, um, you know, they were superficial, they were small, we caught them in a, a timely manner with good treatment. By week you know, five, we've got epithelialization happening across both wound sites um, and the wound was pretty much healed within six to seven weeks. So quite a short time frame in comparison to other DFUs. But when you then um, ask the patient to complete the NeuroQual, these are just some um, examples of where he, he, he ticked different areas, you can see where it says in the past four weeks, how much of your foot problems interfered with your um, ability to perform your paid work, very much, ability to perform tasks around the house or garden, very much, ability to take part in leisure activities, very much. And how has this changed your activities of daily or daily activities? Quite a lot. Um, then just a few more. So I won't choose all of them, I'll just pick out a few. Um, so I feel older than my years as a result of my foot problem, completely agree. My self-confidence is affected, partly agree. My foot problems make my life a struggle, partly agree. I generally feel frustrated, partly agree. I feel depressed because of my foot problems, partly agree. Um, and down here he has, overall I would say problems with my feet reduced my quality of life quite a lot. And overall I would rate my quality of life as fair. So despite, um, I suppose, fairly small superficial wounds that did heal um, fairly uneventfully in a pretty short space of time, you can see the impact that that has had on that individual. Um, so, you know, you can only imagine for those who have non-healing wounds um, over long periods of time, um, how that's actually going to impact on, on them. So again, talking therapy and reflective listening. I like this particular image. So you have this lady sitting here with um, all of the balls of wool jumbled up in her head um, and you know, maybe a lot of confusion, not knowing what's happening. And the role of us as a podiatrist or a clinician is to talk and to listen and to reflectively listen and hopefully start to unjumble those balls in, in, in her head um, into making some level of sense about the situation um, and how we can go about improving um, the the, the wound for that individual. Assess patient involvement. This comes from the international best practice statement for optimizing patient involvement in wound management. So again, seek patient views about what they understand about their condition. How do you feel about your wound? What do you understand about your wound? Identify any fears or concerns that the person might have. Um, so how does the wound affect your 
activities of daily living? Um, how does it affect your personal relationships? Establish what's important to the individual. So what do you want to achieve in short term, long term, and about setting those priorities? And then assessing patient willingness to be involved. What do you want to know about your wound or do you know how to manage it? What can you do to help heal your wound? What's your living circumstances for anybody who's there to help you with your wound? And, and this was something that again came up with speaking to our patient panel when we were talking about a holistic approach. So they expressed some concern and lack of a holistic approach in identifying priorities, psychological and financial uh, support actually came up as well for people living with um, diabetic foot ulcerations. And the feeling that life was on hold, um, a lot of transport issues, trying to come to the clinic on a regular basis could interfere with life. Um, and someone mentioned about medication burden. So a lot of polypharmacy and the volume of medications needed and the side effects associated with them. Um, so some of the quotes, it was, it's bad waiting for that thing, um, patient's hip operation um, to be done because they can't do it because of that and pointed it at the toe. So there was a diabetic foot ulcer on the, on the toe um, and she couldn't go for a hip replacement because of that. So that was that feeling of life being on hold. Um, and when I haven't got my daughter, um, my daughter of mine, her partner to take me here, it's kind of costly. So again, reference to the, the volume of, of visits required for redressings, for instance. So just um, finally, we're starting to think about just how would we address well-being? So ask about well-being using a holistic approach, prioritize well-being and the assessment, treatment and management of the wound, involve patients in their care, and particularly that promotion and shared decision making, and use their feedback to help to plan and adapt services. And very importantly, do know when to refer. And things you can ask in terms of trigger questions. So just has your wound improved or got worse? Has your wound stopped you from doing things in the last week? What causes you the most disturbances or distress? Do you have anyone to help you cope? What would help to ease or improve your daily experience of living with the wound? And then if you're interested in, in bringing motivational interviewing in, I think certainly um, there's huge scope for this and um, a lot of scope for, for research and looking at outcomes associated with involving motivational interviewing. Um, but generally the spirit of motivational inter interviewing is collaboration with your patients um, and acceptance, um, evoc uh, evocation, uh, which is basically trying to encourage people to um, address their own lifestyle factors um, and compassion. So I think compassion and empathy are things that we most definitely need to give to individuals when they present with diabetic foot ulceration. So just in conclusion, psychological variables can play a key role in the prevention and treatment of diabetic foot ulcers. And I think they often can get overlooked in clinical practice because we're in busy environments and really we're, we have under time pressure to look at the physical aspects of a wound. But maybe just stop and, and think about addressing the psychological aspects of the patient, because if we can, then hopefully we'll get better outcomes. And our ultimate goal really is to optimise well-being to ultimately prevent ulceration from happening in the first place. But if it has happened, we want it to improve healing and we want to prevent reoccurrence from happening. And we want to ensure that all of the parties are engaged in that process. So I like this final quote, walk gently in the lives of others. Not all wounds are visible. So thank you very much for your time this evening. And that was absolutely amazing. Thank you so much for that. Now, before we dive into the Q&A section of our um, live event, uh, we just wanted to discuss uh, tomorrow's podiatry awards that are coming up. Um, we have a short list. Um, so please stick around to see uh, Professor Carol, uh, Catherine Bowen's uh, short video on that. So it's a great pleasure for me to let you know who the um, nominations and the winners of the Research Student of the Year are for tomorrow's podiatry. Uh, before I'll keep you in suspense before I mention the names. These students have all um, been nominated for going out of their way and for um, being um, part of that research community at their institutions and they've been nominated by the research staff which, which is a great honour for them. Um, what it will mean, um, the prize of this for their career, it will always be on their CV. 
Um, I know myself when I'm looking at applications of students coming on to progress um, through academia and you see a prize like this, then you know that that particular person has gone out of their way at some stage in their career to, to go that little bit further and push the professional boundaries. So here we go, without further ado, I just think brilliant work, all four of you. Um, the Research Student of the Year are Anita, Anika Hock, Benedictine Kaur, Emma Canty, and Jennifer Scott. And I'm just gonna give you a round of applause because I think it's brilliant. And please keep going, keep in touch with all your mentors. Um, you've got a fantastic uh, career ahead of you all. That's fantastic. Congratulations to all the shortlist nominees. Um, please stick around for uh, Friday, 25th June at 7 p.m. when the winners will be announced. All right, let's get into some of these questions. Um, Emily Howarth, uh, she begins by saying, hi, Caroline, really important to highlight this. How do you suggest we engage patients to come central to clinical decision making? Yeah, I mean, it, it's, it's a, it's absolutely crucial in, in terms of how we move forward, I think, in terms of involving patients in that decision making. I think it's important, first of all, to um, you know ask patients what they understand about their wound and what their priorities are in terms of, of wound healing. And I think that would be a starting point to um, hopefully come up with a combined management plan in terms of, of what we plan to do going forward with the, um, the patient and their wound. Um, there will undoubtedly be some patients, and I, and I said in, in my talk from our panel, they were basically saying, you know, they're the bosses and we'll do what they say. And there will be some mm -hmm. patients who undoubtedly will want to st stay um, in that frame of mind because they're happy enough to um, work along the model of you do what's best for me, you know best. Um, but for other patients, I think it, it can be really important to try to work with them to establish what their goals are, what their priorities are in terms of wound healing um, and how it's impacting on them in terms of their daily living and other things they'd like to set, you know, set goals in terms of you know, it might be that the, there's an odour attached to the wound. What can we do there? That might be actually their priority when we're focusing on trying to debride something or get something to heal. It might be actually be living with odour on a 24-7 basis. That's their main priority. And they just want us to take that smell away, for instance. Um, so I think it's really getting to the core of what's most important to the patient. And that's the starting point for bringing patients into a shared uh, care plan. Mm -hmm. I understand, yeah. Um, Emily also asks, uh, depression, as you say, can be a big blockage to encouraging patient engagement, which is a very good point. Um, shouldn't we be social? Uh, should we shouldn't we be social prescribing and uh, encouraging exercise or group support groups? Yeah, absolutely. And that came very strongly in our panel. Um, I, I do think a model like the Lindsay Leg Clubs that I mentioned in my talk would actually be really powerful, even when we've we brought together a panel both through the Alliance for Research and Innovation in Wounds where we've looked at people living with all types of chronic wounds um, and when we've come together as a group to talk about it everybody's actually found it's that support network of being able to talk to other people who are living with a, a similar condition um, that provides that support and I think that bit is really missing that we don't address any of the social factors and and I think that would be a really important aspect to look at um, and yes absolutely I, I think as a profession if we want to think about pre um, prevention more, then I think we should be getting involved in social prescribing um, and thinking about, you know, structured exercise regimes. Um, I, I don't see why we shouldn't be at the forefront of that, to be honest, as, as a profession. Mm -hmm. That's really good. Um, Emily also asks, HSC have a chronic disease well-being online group running at the moment. I referred a few of mine to it with good positive reviews. Who are we? Right. <laughs> Who are we to understand the quality of life issues and trying to live with a chronic disease every day? That's a fantastic point. It can be switched off. Uh, sorry, it can't be switched off. Sometimes mm -hmm. I think just listening helps. 
And I think that is adding adding to what you, you were saying earlier as well. Um, she's yeah. like, sorry, yeah. me again. This subject is highly important. As you can tell, she's very she's very connected with this with this discussion. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, treating the whole person is not just the foot, uh, not just the foot is an area I'm passionate about. This is an area, uh, Caroline, you see the chronic disease hubs in the HSC implementing more. Uh, motivational interviewing, group supports, health behavior changes, listening, prescribing social and exercise programs, reflect on our own style of talking with a patient and changing how we respond slash our body language, etc. We may be causing the um, barrier. That part got cut off, but I think she's saying we may be causing the barrier. Mm. Yeah, I, I I absolutely agree, um, I, and and it's great to see that that wellbeing has been uh, looked at by the HSC here in in Ireland, um, and that patients are finding that beneficial. That's really good to hear because I I, I think personally we do overlook um, the aspect of of wellbeing, and unless we actually, uh, it, it's kind of corny when you say unless you you know we treat the hole in the foot, but we don't treat the hole of the person, and <laughs> and I think it's really important that we um, look holistically because we we both won't get the best outcomes and we could be the barrier as Emily's suggesting there if we don't mm -hmm. engage with somebody appropriately and I think sometimes just taking the time out of your 20-minute presentation to actually just ask those questions like you know what is it that affects you the most do you have any source of support how can we help you um it just and to, to practice reflective listening um which is really important in terms of you know really listening to somebody showing empathy and reflecting back and and really that's kind of part of the spirit of motivational interviewing as well that emily was talking about mm -hmm. i'd like to ask though um why is it do you think that practitioners sometimes don't do that style of you know um asking questions and engaging with patients like is there something that's holding practitioners back is there something that we can adjust even at a student level yeah, I mean, I, th I think certainly from, I know myself from working in diabetic foot clinics, very often the patient comes in, you have, you know, 20 minutes to to, to go through a, a patient assessment and to do mm -hmm. all of your your wound care. And it's very easy to just put your head down and concentrate on the, the, the ulceration. And as I say, I think we're, we're excellent at treating the physical aspects of um, diabetic foot ulcers. But when it comes to the psychological aspect, maybe we don't consider things as holistically. And certainly even in the research, we Lauren Connell would have uh, done as part of her master's degree, a scoping review that looked at the research that's out there in terms of the tools to assess the domains of well-being. And most of the tools are there that assess physical and some psychological, um, including things like health related quality of life. But there's absolutely very little that looks at the social aspect. And yet so social isolation comes through massively uh, when you're talking to, to patients when they're living with a, a diabetic foot ulcer. And there's very little on spiritual or cultural issues. And again, that could be a significant barrier is if a clinician doesn't understand um, spiritual or cultural preferences in terms of people living with a diabetic foot ulcer. Mm, that is really interesting. Do you feel that this will, this will change um, how our modules get taught to us? Like, do you think this is something that will be integrated in the future in our, in our modules and how we as students behave in clinic? I'd hope so, because a lot of, um, you know, modern healthcare is really looking at health behaviour change. Um, and really, we should move away from any kind of traditional models of that kind of compliance issue and, and imparting our knowledge and hoping that somebody takes it on board, because we know that the research says it doesn't work particularly well. So I would hope that, um, yeah, health behaviour change would become an inherent part of, of undergraduate podiatry training um, and looking at psychological approach approaches um, and you know the impact and what we can do um, in terms of motivational interviewing or, or different techniques with with our um, patients because I think that really is the way that we should be moving forward. Absolutely I 100% agree there's there is something you mentioned earlier about the psychologists not being supportive mm. why do you think that is or what was causing that, yeah. that lack of support? Um, I think I meant in terms of the, there's usually no support available to um, right. patients. So generally you would have your members of the multidisciplinary team, but often the psychologist is missing from that. 
So um, certainly in the areas that I've worked, we wouldn't have direct referral routes onto psychology, for instance, to support people. Mm -hmm. And really, when you think someone's been firstly diagnosed with something like diabetes, it's quite a, a life changing um, situation to, to start to you know, realize that they've got this chronic disease that now needs to be managed. And certainly when somebody develops a diabetic foot ulcer, there's an, an awful lot um, to, to go through in terms of, of coping. Um, and living with a chronic wound. So I, I think psychology could play a much greater role in helping people with depression, anxiety, fear, um, but yet they're not really an integrated member of foot protection teams. Mm -hmm. So it does, it does cause quite an imbalance when we are treating yeah. and patient compliance. So yeah, I guess that is good. Yeah, that does come full circle, doesn't it, at the end of the day? Yeah, yeah. Um, I had so many questions for you, but then as you went through your slides, you answered each and every one of them. So I've just crossed them out. That's always <laughs> like, a good sign. <laughs> I've like whittled it down to like maybe one or two questions. Um, so let me ask you, what motivated you to do research in this? So, yeah, we started off um, looking at the Cochrane Review, really. We, we, we wrote the protocol for the Cochrane Review back in 2017. Um, and in reading around kind of the, the psychological um, impact, I realized there was quite a significant gap in the literature. Um, and, you know, thinking about some of the patient cases that I, I brought into the presentation there, I mean, clinically, you, you, you know when there's issues um, like, you know, aggression or anxiety, depression um, within the clinical setting. And I suppose my research interest was then born out of realizing that really, that we're not really looking into this at all. There's so little research on prevention, but also really little research on looking at the wider holistic picture around DFDs um, and then thinking about the clinical scenarios that I would have encountered. Um, and really that, a lot of my research would have initially been on kind of wound healing interventions. Um, and really I thought there's this huge gap here that needs to be addressed. Um, so I, I started looking around the topic a lot more um, and we started looking into the domains of well-being and looking at the research that was available um, so yeah it was really born from from that um, I, I worked with Kylie Williams actually we did a, um, a paper on spirituality in podiatry as well um, and it was really thinking about yeah there's massive cultural issues that that can impact on somebody's beliefs um, as well as you know the, all of those social aspects that have just been completely overlooked really in the in the research literature Mm. I can um I can imagine you feeling you know a, a little bit frustrated that there is such a gap. Mm. So yeah, you know yeah, a lot of work to be done. But it'd be fantastic to see some of our future you know podiatry graduates uh, embracing the kind of psychosocial aspects of of chronic disease, not just in diabetes, but in any of the chronic diseases that we we manage. Um, so it'd be fantastic. Hopefully, um, you know, it might inspire some research ideas for for people coming out and wanting to go on to do uh, postgraduate degrees. But um, it would be great to to start to build a, a body of evidence in podiatric medicine in in uh, this area. Mm -hmm. I absolutely think so. I mean, it's such it's so great to like eventually build that bridge between podmed and psychology because yeah. a lot of what well, we we don't really discuss too much about uh mental health impacts do we in our no in, in the profession so it's, no. it's so no. great to yeah. actually have this even as a student i mean just having that research material available at your fingertips which actually yeah. i was going to ask you um is there any way we can access these slides if we want uh yes yeah yeah i'm sure i can link in with michael and we can do something Oh, that'd be fantastic. I would definitely appreciate it. And I know everybody watching here today would 100% appreciate it too. This is a fantastic slide. Um, well, that about wraps it up for today, unless we have any more questions coming through. Lauren was quite happy that you mentioned her. <laughs> so I just wanted to put that out there. <laughs> Absolutely. Over Lauren the led, led on the well-being research and, and um, yeah, she did a fantastic job there. So, you know, it's, it's brilliant to um, be able to, to share some of her work there today. You must be so proud of her. Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> awesome. Great.
Well, thank you so much for the very insightful and very informative lecture today. This was absolutely amazing. And we really appreciate the time and effort you've put into this lecture to help us further expand our knowledge base. Thank you to everybody that participated in the Q&A today. Uh, we look forward to seeing you next week where you get the chance to meet and learn more about our professor, Catherine Bowen, yet another trailblazer and a great leader in women for women in science. See you next week at 8 p.m. Until then, enjoy your week.